Well, I wanted him to see the development in this country. I wanted him to see the possibilities that were open to him in the field of economic cooperation. Uh, I didn't need, I didn't think he needed to see, or Khrushchev needed to see, that the United States was not a paper tiger. Tiger, He knew that. Uh, but I wanted him to see uh, the possibilities of us moving together, even though we disagreed totally in philosophy and uh, in the economic area. Unfortunately, due to congressional reactions and so forth, we weren't able to make much progress that year, at least, and or the next, for that matter. Why do you think he felt so strongly about staying with you personally at La Casa Pacifica? He wanted to avoid an incident. He knew what had happened to Khrushchev. Where did he stay? Well, he stayed in uh, uh, Trisha's bedroom. Uh, it was, it's, it's not a very big room, as a matter of fact, uh, but a very beautifully decorated in feminine colors and so forth, and this big bear of a man in that uh, uh, girl's uh, dressing room was really something to see. You gave a poolside party for him that you have uh, since described as being sort of a Hollywood who's who. Do you think he understood the difference between the guest list there and the guest list at the White House? Oh, yes. The guest list at the White House was uh, primarily business types and political types and the rest, and he was very impressed by them as well. Uh, but on the poolside party, it was a celebrity party. And uh, after all, he loved the Western movies and the Westerns and so forth and so on, and he liked meeting those movie stars. He liked meeting uh, Governor Reagan, for example. I think more because Reagan had been a movie star, uh, although they seemed to have a very good, pleasant conversation when they met there. Actually, we have some film of that party, which I think uh, shows uh, Brezhnev talking to the Reagans. Do you remember what they talked about? Or what you, do you remember what you said to him there in introducing them? They're the Sinatras, I see, Frank Sinatra, and Barbara, his wife. No, I don't really remember, uh, but he, as you may recall, President Reagan mentioned that in a letter that he wrote to Brezhnev, what he talked to him about, hmm. in which he said that uh, uh, Brezhnev had uh, spoken very warmly about his desire to have uh, peace, etc. Brezhnev was uh, also, uh, as uh, there's a famous photograph the tests, uh, much taken with Henry Kissinger's date, Jill St. John. Well, yeah, Brezhnev was uh, pretty much of a ladies' man. I mean, uh, he, uh, he was always kind of bragging about that. He had a sort of a macho attitude and so forth. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Mrs. Nixon did not particularly appreciate that uh, aspect of him. Uh, I mean, not that she's prudish about it, but he, he made one crack at, uh, at uh, an airport. I recall when we went down the line and there were a lot of uh, uh, several pretty girls uh, who were there with flowers and so forth uh, welcoming us. This is in, my, in Russia. And he turned to me at the little wink and he said, would you want to take one of these with you? And uh, she didn't pr appreciate that and I understand it well. But as far as Brezhnev is concerned, I remember at Camp David, we had a little incident there which indicated that he had pretty good taste insofar as uh, his ladies were concerned. Uh, I went over to pick him up. He was staying at one of the guest cottages called Dogwood uh, to bring him over to dinner. And uh, he, uh, 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 big, uh, I'd say big, she was a very handsome, full-bosomed uh, uh, Russian girl came out and uh, I shook hands with her. Uh, I was introduced to her, and his aide said it was his masseuse. And, uh, and then I happened to put my hand up to my nose, and she was wearing Arpege, which is one of my, one of my wife's favorite uh, French perfumes, a very expensive one. So he had good taste. Do, do your intelligence briefings tell you, or does the gossip that you get from the NSC or the State Department tell you whether a leader with whom you're negotiating plays around with women? Oh, yes. Does that, do you take that, is, does that have any practical other than gossip interest? Because everybody's interested no, in that. No, you, you, you've got to know what people are interested in. Uh, I, I, don't, I must say, I, I don't go so far as to say that when 
You know that if you provide consorts for them when they come, although that has been known to happen in some countries. Uh, and it's also been known that, uh, uh, that some of the leaders, when they go to these countries, they ask for that. I remember Borgiba, the president of uh, the uh, country of Tunisia, was speaking about Sukarno, the president of uh, Indonesia, coming to uh, Tunisia and uh, speaking very uh, deprecatingly of him. He said, you know, here's this man coming to my country, and we had a lot of important things to talk about. And you know what the first thing he said when we met? He wanted unfam, a girl. Well, uh, so they furnished a girl. There's, there's a story that, uh, that the usually unflappable Harold Macmillan was flapped when John Kennedy on one of their meetings told him that unless he had sex three times a day, he got a headache. Well, he can take extra strength Tylenol for that. After, the, uh, after this poolside party, you gave a very small uh, dinner for Brezhnev in your dining room. Uh, what was that like? Very emotional affair. Uh, at the dinner, now he's a Russian again. Uh, when we met earlier, uh, he was a communist speaking about the Chinese, but he was a Russian. Uh, I proposed a toast at the end of the dinner, pointing out that this house was relatively small, but it was ours. The dining room seated only 10 people. And uh, in, in uh, short, uh, that I hoped that what we did uh, would uh, help to bring peace uh, for our children, for his children, and for our grandchildren, and for the children of the world. Well, he was very moved by that, and he, he got up out of his chair, and there were tears were coming down his cheeks, and he gave me a bear hug, uh, had a very responsive toast uh, in which he uh, endorsed that proposition. Uh, he wanted to feel, in a way, he wanted to feel that what he did, even though he still had uppermost the idea of extending communist nomination in the world, preferably without war, but he wanted to have the feeling that what he did contributed to a better world for children and grandchildren. And, and so in that respect, uh, he, he was uh, very much And then after that, after dinner, uh, he wanted to see Mrs. Nixon and me alone. And he took us aside and he had a little box with him, about this big, and he took out a scarf, a beautiful scarf. Uh, he said it had been made by artisans in his home village. And he said every stitch in this scarf uh, represents affection from the people of Russia for the people of the United States, and from Mrs. Brezhnev and me to you and to Mrs. Nixon. So uh, there's the Russian speaking. Now, he wasn't giving us that little scarf uh, because he thought that might have an effect in softening me up for negotiations about China and so on and so forth. He was giving it because there was a warmth about the man at the time. Uh, so as I say, uh, as communists, I must say I could not have been more opposed to him uh, as a Russian. Uh, I could not help but like him as a Russian, as a person. Within a couple of hours after this display of Russian sentimentality, weren't you exposed to uh, some of his uh, communist side in a very direct yeah, way? Yeah, I had gone to bed, not because uh, I wanted to go, but uh, there was nothing more to do. He excused himself right after dinner. Uh, we didn't sit around for coffee or brandy, and he said he'd had a very long flight, and he wanted to go uh, uh, and I, uh, rest. And I said, well, of course, because I knew the flight time had changed and so forth. And however the case might be, I knew he was tired, or at least he said he was. So I went in, and I was reading in bed, and about 10 o'clock, Manola, our uh, help, uh, our, uh, my aide, uh, knocks on the door and said uh, he wants to talk. And <laughs> so Kissinger... Uh, I asked him what it was about. He says, who knows about these people? So uh, I got dressed, and uh, Brezhnev uh, uh, said to me with a sort of an apologetic smile, he says, I couldn't sleep. And uh, so Brezhnev, Kissinger, and I, along with uh, Gromyko and Dobrynin, all went up to our tiny little library uh, on the second floor at Casa Pacifica. In fact, it's the only area where there is a second floor. And from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the morning, we went through the same kind of an exercise we had gone through at the Dasha in 1972, this time in the Mideast. He was insisting 
that the United States and the Soviet Union impose a statement of principles on the Israelis and on the Arabs. Now what he really wanted was to get the Soviet Union uh, into a position of having influence within the, uh, the Mideastern area and also to, uh, of course, uh, to put Israel in a position where it had to cave with regard to its demands for security before it could make peace. Well, we couldn't agree to anything like that, so it went on and on and on uh, until he finally gave up around 1 o'clock in the morning and said he'd have to go back empty-handed. Was Brezhnev different away from his colleagues, away from the Kremlin? They all have a tendency, uh, and Brezhnev is no exception, uh, to be more forthcoming, uh, not quite as stiff away from their colleagues. I think before their colleagues, they feel they're being watched. They have to put on a show. They've got to prove that they're very tough. They've got to show off. Away, it's, it's like, for example, the same thing with congressmen and senators on television. One of the reasons I'm not for televising sessions of the House and Senate, or even committees, is that, that the congressmen and senators have got to show off. Uh, and showing off, they don't necessarily uh, do what is best uh, for the cause, whatever it may be. Uh, they're talking to the audience rather than to the issue. And so it was with Brezhnev. He'd be showing off in front of his colleagues, and so it was with Khrushchev. But you get in a private conversation. The hair comes down a, g a bit. They begin to be more forthcoming. I don't mean that they're going to be make a deal that they wouldn't make publicly, uh, but at least you can talk to them. They will, uh, there's a more running room for conversation. So therefore, whenever possible, I tried to see him, and as a matter of fact, any leader of a communist country, or of another country for that matter, alone, with a translator if necessary, and nobody else, at least for a time. I find that you usually make more progress in that kind of a meeting than in one where you have a whole bevy of people around you. Because we all have a tendency, every leader, to attempt to prove himself, prove his manhood, so to speak, before his associates. Did you find that his, uh, his jokiness, his uh, sense of humor was more unrestrained uh, away from Russia? Oh, I think so. No, he wouldn't, uh, he didn't, particularly after sort of the fool Khrushchev made of himself on occasion, uh, he wasn't about to be undignified uh, in the presence of his own people. Uh, for example, uh, when he's with the White House, uh, we were signing documents and that sort of thing. He spills some champagne on his happen to. There's a famous uh, film of that's that. That's right, too, yes. on his tie, and he held his handkerchief up in front of the television camera, and he clowned it around a bit. Uh, and then when we were signing the documents, uh, he would look over at me signing, and then he'd sign as if he were racing to see who could sign the first or last or whatever the case might be. He'd never do that in the Soviet Union. Now that, of course, was still in public, but I just think it was different. He was a little bit less constrained. Do you feel that his uh, cigarette box held any deep insights into his character? <laughs> he, had a, uh, he had a problem with regard to smoking. He shouldn't have smoked because he had a cough on occasion. Uh, and he had other problems, too, in health problems. And his doctor had told him not to smoke. So they rationed him on cigarettes. And he very proudly showed me his beautiful cigarette box. And suddenly that was one of the differences between him and Khrushchev. Khrushchev would never have had uh, uh, a fancy cigarette box. And Khrushchev wore open shirt whenever he could or, and uh, wouldn't dream of wearing cufflinks. He usually wore the short sleeve shirts. But Brezhnev and all of his colleagues, by the time we got there in 72, they all had beautiful gold cufflinks. And in this case, this uh, cigarette box, which he showed me. And it had a timer on it. Every hour, it would pop up a cigarette. He was supposed to smoke only eight a day or nine or whatever the case might be, however he was up. So he had his timer and he'd start smoking it. Then he had another package of cigarettes down in here. And in about another 15 minutes, he'd reach in, pull this package out, and smoke it too. Uh, so, in other words, it didn't help much. But I think he considered it a game in any event. I don't think it had any s uh, psycho history meaning, as some of our amateur psychologists would agree. If you were, and I know that the last thing you would be is a psychohistorian, how would you psychoanalyze, psychohistoricize Brezhnev in terms of his background and in terms of his, the qualities of his personality and leadership? Well, I have so little. Uh, frankly, respect for psychohistorians, and I don't even think I can comment on that. Uh, I saw him for what he was, 
Uh, I, I saw him as a self-assured leader uh, of a very strong people and uh, uh, one who would uh, take advantage when he could. Uh, one, on the other hand, who recognized that he lived in a real world where uh, sometimes it's best uh, to make a deal rather than to, frankly, risk making war. And under the circumstances, that's about the way I'd see him. But I, I'm not going to get into that psychohistory business. Was it his interest in uh, Western movies that uh, led him to his uh, dealings with Chuck Connors, the rifleman? Well, Connors had been in, uh, Chuck Connors had been in Russia. In fact, we had sort of worked that out as in part of our exchange program. And Chuck Connors, who was a former baseball player, he was a fair baseball player before he went into the movies, and a great big fellow. And so when he saw Khrushchev, uh, I mean, when, when Chuck Connors saw Brezhnev ready to take off in the helicopter, he happened to be out there at the pad, San Clemente, uh, Brezhnev waved to him, and Chuck Connors rushed over to him and just bodily lifted him up in the air, and they laughed. It was, uh, Brezhnev was not a bit embarrassed. If uh, Brezhnev had held up a paper to one of the chandeliers at Camp David and said, can I have eight copies of this, uh, would uh, they have been brought in 10 minutes later? Well, we didn't have any taping equipment at Camp David. And as a matter of fact, we also did not have television cameras, as far as I know, any time. I mean, uh, uh, no administration. Uh, there was taping, Johnson taped, and of course Eisenhower taped, and Kennedy and the rest. But the point is that what Henry was referring to was something very different. He was referring to a television camera up there in that chandelier, which very possibly they did have. Uh, which incidentally could tell you a great deal in the event that television camera were in the bedroom because they often use them for purposes of blackmail. If people but know. We, uh, we've never gotten that sophisticated. Or that lucky. <laughs> if, if, since people know that, every so often a diplomat is, an American diplomat is expelled for having been caught in flagrante delicto in such a case. They have to know that they're being set up. How do, how do people get caught in such an obvious uh, way? Well, part of it is stupidity, and uh, part of it is, uh, I think I just leave it to stupidity. Uh, I, I can't say that it's all emotion and affection and love, and not really. Do you think that the, uh, that the State Department or the uh, CIA didn't have uh, Brezhnev bugged in Blair House or uh, at Camp David or even uh, at the Casa Pacifica? No, they didn't. No, sir, I wouldn't have allowed it. No, Are you sure you would have known about it? Oh, yes. Yeah, I think so. Oh, maybe not, but I think so. No, uh, Camp David did not have any taping equipment, uh, neither did Casa Pacifica. Now, in Johnson's period, the ranch was taped. Uh, I don't know what the situation was in Kennedy's period, but Camp David, uh, the White House living quarters, uh, Casa Pacifica were never taped. Is it not then our uh, policy to, uh, to bug foreign leaders who come here? We bug them, uh, but uh, we don't do it here. Uh, for example, uh, it's been quite well known that uh, both in this country and in the Soviet Union we attempt to bug each other's embassies, uh, and we attempt to bug a lot of other embassies in this country, and should, because that's uh, expected to be done. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, there's also evidence to the effect that Brezhnev's car was bugged. By uh, us. By us, that's right. Not here in this country, but in the Soviet Union. A and uh, w one of the reasons that the release of the Pentagon Papers caused great concern in the CIA was that one of the items in the Pentagon Papers could only have come from the fact that we had Brezhnev's car bugged. If, if all this bugging is going on all over the world. Why do we draw a line at, uh, when, at, at our own shores when they come here, when presumably what we learn could be very useful in terms of the way their discussions and negotiations that are going on? Well, I'm not the best one to comment on that. <laughs> I think we have reached a, a point where we I should, uh, just before Summit 3, where we should probably. The, actually, you answered my question because the evidence about the bugging of the car was pre-Nixon, was uh, uh, Johnson.
the, the, the Pentagon Papers evidence of uh, Bogdan oh, sure. Brezhnev's car was under uh, mm -hmm. Johnson. That was, uh, that was abroad, though. Yeah. In Russia. In Russia. Yeah. Oh, sure. And I hope they still were. Now, what about the, uh, between, between you and me, what about the Indian cabinet? Oh, that was bugged away. Oh, sure, but I'm, I'm going to put it a different way. I said, we just learned an absolutely unimpeachable source, and you can trust me. And I say, because we have...